Season 12 of Heartland Highways kicks off with a group of rural East Central Illinoisans who restore cemeteries. Then it's over to Casey, Illinois, the home of the multiple world records. And finally, she gets a lot of attention and is always dressed for the occasion. Meet the Charleston area's Gracie the Shark. That's coming up on Heartland Highways. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits, opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning, available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114. Welcome to an all new season of Heartland Highways. I'm Lori Casey. And I'm Kate Pleasant. And we've got a great lineup of adventures to share with you in our 12th season. Now two of our stories today take us to Casey, Illinois. It was a viewer who told us about some volunteers who were doing restoration work at the cemeteries in Martinsville and Casey. So on one of the hottest days of the summer, we headed out to the Washington Street Cemetery to meet up with Jim Nix and Joe Hawker and check out their work. Okay. We try to do it safely, and most of the time I'll tell Jim what direction I'm going to go or when I'm about to do it. So just in case that he's around and I might hit him, why he might duck. <laughs> All kidding aside, these guys take their work and their safety very seriously. In August of 2011, Jim Nix saw the need for someone to spend some time fixing up old headstones that had fallen down or were in danger of falling. Being retired, he thought it might be a good project, and well, let's say one thing led to another. I've been retired for about six years now, uh -huh. and just thought, well, this might be a nice thing to do. And my family uh, in Franklin County has a cemetery, and that's it's just pristine, it's just taken care of. And when I saw some of the stones around here and in Martinsdale Township, I thought maybe this is something that I could get some guys to help me and we could, we could see what we could do. Well, I am on one of the cemetery trustees in Martinsville Township. Mm -hmm. And our township supervisor uh, got a hold of Jim and that's how we got into it. He gave a presentation and we worked from there. And why have the tractor? Without the tractor, we couldn't do it. But hydraulics does wonders. I basically started here and with some volunteers here in town. And then we moved over to Martinsville Township and we worked over there in a, what they call city cemetery, which dates back to 1835. Mm -hmm. And we set up stones, very typical of what we see here in Washington Street in Casey. Mm -hmm. And we did 209 stones. My wife cleaned stones that didn't need to be straightened. She cleaned the biological growth off for 33. Mm -hmm. And uh, then this spring, when we started, we went out to RUPP, they call it Roop Cemetery. It's between Martinsville and I-70. And we, so far, we've done over 170 stones there. We've done about 15 to 18 stones here. Mm -hmm. We just started the other day. <laughs> Jim received training through the Illinois Historic Preservation Agency for cemetery restoration and a permit to do this type of work. Most of their time is focused on headstones dating from the 1880s and up. Uh, presently, we have uh, we have permits for nine cemeteries, but we'll not get all of those this year, so we'll have to go back next year. In other words, there's plenty of work to go around. We met the guys working in Casey at the Washington Street Cemetery. Their primary job here is to reset stones that are in danger of falling, which is a multi-step process. Typically, the, the stones that we're looking at most are what they call pedestal stones. They have 
a foundation, at least a foundation, and, and the top stone. Generally though, the ones that we have, have a foundation, then a marble base, and then they will have a pyramidal or an obelisk shaped uh, top stone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those will have some ornamentation like an urn and, and uh, drape over it. The foundation, uh, if it's unlevel, we remove it with a tractor, tractor and straps. We lift that out and then uh, prior to that, probably though, we take off the top, I should mention that. We take off the top stones, then the foundation. And then we take out, a lot of times there will be chunks of concrete, they'll be on layers of bricks, totally unsatisfactory. There will be pea gravel and sand, which is really unsatisfactory, and that's caused the stone to tip. Uh, and then we take that out, we dig out around the original area of the, the foundation. And then we put a layer of at least four inches of what we call road pack. It's a, it's a crushed limestone. It has fines in it, like powder, all the way up to about a three quarter inch, inch diameter crushed rock. And we tamp that down, level it, and then we take the tractor, put the foundation back in, then we'll have to re-level it and then pack road pack around it for to make it more secure. And after that point, uh, we clean off the top and put a setting compound down. And it looks like putty. And we put plastic spacers, which were about an inch square and an eighth an inch thick. And we put those down around the setting compound to make sure the weight of the stones on top doesn't press it out and then therefore weaken the stone. Generally, unless it's an extra large stone, we can usually get those about, oh, about three or four a day. So we work only about four to four and a half hours a day. Mm -hmm. Then we come back the next day. Yeah. So for half a day for how many days will you do this? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we'll live long enough. <laughs> we will probably not do any work after mid-October. Do, does this kind of work keep you young, do you think? <laughs> well, after it's done, I don't feel young, but I usually recover to be back the next day. Uh -huh. So I guess I'm fortunate I'm pretty good health. Uh -huh. It's uh, just a job that needs done. And this is the period of time we have to do it in. Mm -hmm. and we don't. Our age group don't work a full day. Well, not out here anyway. Yeah. And I'm the senior member on it. Jim's next. In addition to working on stones, the volunteers also worked on the mausoleum at the cemetery. These panels were loose, and some of these stones, the what I call the epitaph stones, were in danger of falling out, some had. And uh, so anyway, what we did is Dan and his son and a first cousin that works with him put these uh, sawed out. Uh, it's kind of a concrete board substance, mm -hmm. so it's there for as long as they had a need for this. And we put those up, and then they reinforced the, they reinforced the stones and these, these slats right here to make sure that these were all solid and firm. While spending time in a cemetery may seem spooky to some, it can also be a history lesson. The one that looks like a tree branch, you can see the one there, okay. Uh, that is uh, a facsimile of a tree that's been cut. And that the symbolism to that is that that is a life cut short, okay. And then you have, you have other things, there's all types of, uh, all types of symbols. 
uh, the hand clasp that you will see on a stone. And that's typically mother, daughter, or husband and wife. Mm -hmm. And it just shows that you can tell the difference because the man will have a cuff that is typical of the cuff today. And the lady will have a ruffle cuff. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of different stones. Work like this is not easy, especially on a hot and humid summer day. But it doesn't seem to dampen these guys' enthusiasm for their work or their reasons for doing it. A, a gravestone is a, is a symbol of a departed soul. A sense of accomplishment because it makes the people who does the mowing in the cemetery easier job for them because they don't have to dodge them and it just makes the cemetery look a lot better more appealing to somebody coming in if they see a cemetery that the stones are not standing vertical laying down and i wouldn't want to be buried there so whenever you do the maintenance on the cemetery you have more people that that might be their final desire to be buried in that cemetery The small community of Casey, Illinois is doing some big things to break worldly records in the form of a wind chime, knitting needles, a crochet hook, and even a golf tee. That's right. Stay with us as we travel down the Heartland Highway on State Road 49, where these record breakers far surpass 49 inches. When it comes to having a handle on world records, Casey, Illinois is the place. Meet Jim Bolin. While his profession involves pipeline maintenance, his hidden passion is constructing world records. His first record breaker sure knows how to carry a tune. While this huge wind chime is deep in bass, it welcomes visitors with a song and story. It all starts back uh uh, on vacations with my family. We like seeing a lot of neat stuff and and when we run into this neat stuff we're always thinking like wow it'd be great if our if our town had some stuff like this so that's kind of what got the wheel started and uh, I was trying to think of something that uh, would draw people to Casey. I've got some wind chimes at home uh, because wind chimes make me uh, think of my childhood and my grand grandma Whitling that had wind chimes so I, I got up and I thought, well, I wonder what the biggest one in the world is. So <laughs> we looked it up and, and I, it was up in, in Michigan and, and uh, I thought we could beat that because being a pipeline maintenance company and wind chimes are pipe, so it kind of fits. A lot of things had to fit just right to build something of this magnitude. Bolin had to come up with a plan, design, materials and builders. The process to construct the world's largest wind chime took two years. The old record was just over 23 feet high, Boland's creation 42 feet. Jim says his drive to build the biggest doesn't come from competition or kudos, but his faith and love for community. Casey, Illinois is home. I mean, uh, I was born and raised here. Uh, it's a small community. It's, uh, it's been a fun community for me, and uh, just like all sm small communities, it's, it's, it's dying, you know, uh, economic uh, economics around here is, 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 is really slow um, and trying to get a factory or some kind of industry in, in KZ is, 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 is really hard because every small town in Illinois, every small town in the whole United States is fighting for some kind of a, uh, jobs, you know. So instead of waiting around for somebody to come and put a plan in here, we're trying to be proactive and, and tourism is, is kind of like a factory, you know, it puts people to work. If we can get things made where people want to have a destination to come here and visit and see something that's different, uh, they can come to Casey, uh, see something unique, stop someplace and eat, uh, buy some gas, or stop in a shop and maybe uh, do some antiquing or buy something unique or whatever, and spend a, a Saturday or a Friday or a afternoon someplace and just get away from the hustle and bustle and come through and just come to a destination and see what's going on. And it was that mindset and drive that encouraged Jim to come up with another record-breaking idea. You could say this masterpiece has fit the Casey community to a T. 
That's right, Clark County is also home to the world's largest golf tee. But it weighs uh, 6,659 pounds. It's 30 foot uh, and a half inch long. Uh, the world records uh, got it stated at 30 foot nine inches, but that's something we got to get corrected in the future here. But it's 30 foot and a half inch. Uh, the old record was 26 foot, so we beat it uh, by quite a bit. It's, it's made out of yellow pine, so we, we started putting it together one board at a time. There's very, everything's two inches uh, boards. Um, there's um, two by 12s, two by 8s, two by 10s, two by 6s and we just laminated them together with glues and then we took screws and tightened them together and after the glue dried then we'd pull the screws out and then we'd laminate the next board and so on and so forth and um, there's 60 almost 70 gallons of glue external glue on it um, there's 15 coats of marine uh, uh, varnish on the outside like they used to shellac the old wooden boats um, there's some more statistics in there like I, I, there's like uh, it took about 100 pounds of screws. While the chime and golf tee weren't Jim's first world record ideas, and we'll get to that in just a moment, the chime did inspire him to create more. Some of that inspiration came from a little yarn shop on the town's main street. Jeanette Husengay owns the business, and she remembers the day fondly when Jim approached her about being part of an oversized project. And he came down and talked to me and said that he had an idea that would boost my business and would make more traffic coming into Casey and, and boost the tourism. I'm like, oh, go for it. So he came in, he asked for a crochet hook. He asked, um, first he asked for a crochet hook, then he came back and he says, well, if I'm gonna get a crochet hook, I might as well get a knitting needle. He had already researched the records and knew exactly what dimensions they had to be. And he had beautiful replicas of the crochet hook. That's the one I saw first and then the knitting needles. And it, upon my approval, he continued on it. When he got those finished, he delivered them to my store and then, that, then everything fell into my lap and it was my turn to practice with them. And that's been, been a lot of fun. And I like working with wood and that's one of my favorite things. And uh, so I, I thought, why not? Try to build the world's largest uh, knitting needle and crochet hook. Well, I, I come to find out on research, there is no world's largest crochet hook. So, we had to make the first, and the Guinness says it has to be 10 times greater or 10 times larger than the original. So uh, we, we constructed it and uh, made it, uh, it's six foot, one and a half inches long and uh, three inches thick and, and weighs nine pounds. Now the knitting needles are uh, three and one quarter inch uh, in diameter. The, the old record is three and 0.15, we are 3.25. The old record is 11 foot and some inches were 13 foot and a half inch, uh, 13 foot and three quarters of an inch. Um, they weigh 26 pounds a piece, and they're also made out of white pine for being trying to be light but yet stable. In order to be a record breaker, the needles and hook had to be used to make something. Good thing Jeanette started twirling twine at a young age. She had to. The school she attended said it was a must. Well, I've always been um, creative and I've always enjoyed creating things with my hands. Um, knitting was something that I learned when I was little. I was in the fourth, well, I was in the fourth grade when I learned to crochet. A uh, very kind neighbor lady who was babysitting me entertained me by teaching me to crochet. And, you know, I might say that when you do learn at a young age, it really does stick. I went to a school where it was a requirement to learn um, embroidery, <laughs> knitting, and crochet, of course I already knew how to crochet. It was a private school in the South. And so one of my classes, we had to knit some footies. And so that was my first endeavor of knitting. And so with a background of knowledge, a nine pound crochet hook and two 26 pound knitting needles, Jeanette works her craft to ultimately break a record. And on this day, it was in front of hundreds of school kids and other fans using tools of the actual size. Lift after lift, shift after shift, judges watch intently and take notes on what will become a new world record. To, to, to have a Guinness, uh, you have to go through a, a process. The first thing you do is you, you file for a, uh, a number and they'll send you a package and you'll have a, a record number that you have to, everything that you do is related to that, um, it's a, like a filing number. 
okay? And in that package, it tells you all the processes you have to go through to, to gain a Guinness. In that process, you have to have two witnesses uh, to certify your measurements that you do, the weights and all the, the record. And, and why they're doing that, they have to film all this and, and put a package together so when it gets sent off to London, they can go through all this filming process and see it actually for themselves. And Casey is not done seeing or being a world record town. Bolin has another project in the works and you could say it will rock. Working on the world's largest rocking chair, it goes back to chainsawing. Uh, I like to chainsaw, carve, and uh, the world's r largest rocking chair right now is in, in uh, Missouri, Missouri. And, uh, it's out of steel pipe and stuff, and it's cool, and uh, they get a lot of visitors to it, but I got to thinking, what about, you know, most rocking chairs are wooden, so why don't we build a wooden rocking chair? Now, this project may not be finished for a while, and frankly, many of us might think it would be a world of trouble to construct. Jim says it's all part of doing something big to help his small community. What motivates me is, uh, uh, it goes back to Christian beliefs. If you look at the wind chime, there's Christian symbols on the wind chime. Uh, the Bible talks about love thy neighbor, and, uh, uh, and love cover, covers a multitude of sins uh, in First Peter. And it's just the, the love of the community. If we can get the love of the community back together, uh, start out with small things uh, like the wind chimes, and uh, the knitting needles have scripture on them, uh, the golf tee holder will have scripture on it. And if we can love thy neighbor and uh, just become a friendly community, People will want to come and be a part of this community, I really feel like. So um, I just, my part in it is just trying to get it started. And then hopefully a bunch of people start pushing the wagon down the road and it'll just keep snowballing and getting bigger. Our final story always gets a lot of attention and is always dressed for the occasion. That's the truth. We're talking about the Charleston area's Gracie the Shark. <laughs> Swimming the prairie-filled seas of Pat and Valerie Goodwin's home, Gracie has a story all her own. Probably the question that gets asked most is why? Why would I build a shark? And my answer back is why not? Um, That's the only one I know of in Coles County. It's the only one I know maybe in Illinois as a shark. So people ask me, why do I build it? And my question, my answer back is, why not build a shark? You're not going to find an ocean in Illinois, but that doesn't mean you won't find a shark. That's right, a shark. Popping out of the pasture on County Road 1200 East, you'll find Grace swimming the meadow. I've always built some crazy things out here. Um, I've had to take the tractor and we built a snowman one year. I've had some 16 foot reindeer made out of logs out here in the yard. So I've always done some crazy things and always big things. About four years ago, I got a wild burr. I said, I'll just build a shark coming out of the pasture. Um, I just drew some sketches on some paper. And the next thing I knew, I was out in the shop welding away. Had no plans really, just bit by bit. And we formed Grace the shark. Grace's owner, Pat Goodwin, probably had no idea when he was building her just how popular this shark would be. Over the years, she's become quite the centerpiece for pictures. Senior portraits taken with Grace looking on, bike riders stop for a pose. Now it's just as if she's always been there. Well, the, the first week I can say was the most interesting because all of a sudden Grace is out here, even the neighbors, you know, now the neighbors, it's, it's just a normal sight for them. They see the sightseers and that's their new sight. But that first week was crazy. Since then, uh, this is a bike route. We've had a lot of bikers stop by one-on-one -on -one or a group. Um, we've had bikers out here where they look like the sharks chase them on their bike. It's been part of scavenger hunts. One Saturday was out here and everybody was stopping by taking pictures. So I came out and I said, well, what's going on today? And they said, well, Grace was part of a scavenger hunt. They had to find the shark in Coles County. When you do come across the famous Grace, she's likely to be dressed to the nines. That's another trademark that makes this fish so famous. She's been dressed in a lot of different things. We've had a one Halloween, she had a witch riding her. Uh, it's been Uncle Sam at 4th of July with the big beard and the outfit and everything for the, the 4th of July. Um, I was wanting to have Grace with Santa Claus in his mouth. Uh, I got voted down on that with the family. So Grace actually the first year pulled Santa Claus in a big sleigh and I had Christmas lights and everything out here on her. Um, last year during the drought, she had a big sign and act like she was thirsty and praying for rain. While Pat says he enjoys coming up with the costumes, what gives him the most pleasure 
is the joy this meadow shark brings to others. We build it for the kids and the people to have fun with, and they do. They stop by every day. We, when a car pull in the driveway, and they just, I don't know, it's been a couple weeks ago, a father and a son, and he was carrying the son, and they wanted to know if they'd come out. His son wanted to stop and see the shark. And I said, that's why I build it. I build it for the kids and the family. They have fun with it. It's a, just a common occurrence that we'll be sitting there in the house and we'll see a car slow down, stop, and they'll get out and take photos. And that's my enjoyment, that they're getting enjoyment for something I built. Thanks for coming along with us today, and this is just one of the many adventures in store for you this season. So we hope to see you again next time. Heartland Highways is made possible in part by EIU's Academy of Lifelong Learning, providing all community members an outlet for their educational, social, and creative pursuits. Opportunities to learn new skills, engage in topics of interest, and explore new areas of learning. Available for people of all ages. More information available at 581-5114.